Dank, Urs, und vielen Dank für die Einladung hier in Paderborn. Es freut mich, ähm, äh, versuchen Paderborn, ähm, es tut mir leid, äh, ich, ich spreche nur wenig Deutsch, entschuldigen Sie, ich will meine Rede auf Englisch machen. Thank you very much for that over generous introduction. I am really honored to be here. And um, it's wonderful to revisit Paderborn for a second time. Can you hear me okay? okay. Today I'm going to talk about this, where history and philosophy meet. Um, and I'm going to say more about the historical than the philosophical because one of the areas I really have been trying to think about is I've been thinking a lot about the problems of recovering the women from the past and making them, making them um, known uh, to, to, to people today. So I want to discuss some of the more historiographical issues relevant to restoring female philosophers of the past to view today. Um, and I'm going to argue that they have not been very well served by the Anglo-American idea of the hi of philosophical history. Um, and I'm going to argue that, uh, they, that we really have needed, and it's very important to have a historical approach to, to, to recover them. And this perhaps reflects my formation in a, an institution of German origin, the Warburg Institute, um, which is a very uh, wonderful place, and we in Britain are ri the British really do not understand what a jewel they have in their in the University of London's crown. Um, but this this the, I was very fortunate to be there, um, and that that accounts for the very interdisciplinary approach I take. Well, the last thirty years have been a truly exciting time. In uh, there's been a gender revolution in the drive to restore women to view in all aspects of uh, intellectual life. Women's history has grown exponentially and feminist philosophy has flourished. And in their wake, interest in women philosophers has increased steadily. The pioneering work of women like Eileen O'Neill, Mary Ellen Waite, Therese Bus Dekerman, in the 1990s means that it is no longer credible to deny that there were significant numbers of female philosophers in the past or that they had anything philosophically interesting to say. There have been several attempts to analyse the philosophy of those women for, for whom philosophical texts survive and to integrate them into the history of philosophy. Um, there have even been attempts to write separate histories of women's philosophy. Some people have, sh have sought to show the relevance of particular women philosophers to modern philosophy by highlighting themes and, um, and theories which anticipate uh, 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 um, a modern, um, modern, modern interests. Um, there have also been attempts to show where these women sit in relation to the canon of male philosophers in the topics they treat. For example, Conway with Leibniz, uh, uh, Du Châtelet with Newton and, uh, and Wolff. Others, especially feminist philosophers, have focused on critiquing the male canon and the philosophy represented in it and its exclusion of women. Some of the most influential early studies identified philosophy itself as the problem, particularly philosophical reason which was treated with suspicion in, in body-centred feminist epistemologies. As a result of the work of, of people like Susan Bordeaux and Genevieve Lloyd, Cartesianism was presumed the fons et origo of modern rationalism, and it was treated for a period as inherently misogynistic. Political scientists, notably Carol Pateman, entered the fray, exposing the anti-female bias of the very principles underlying the canon of political philosophy, for instance, of Locke. Wary of philosophers' claims to gender neutrality, feminists short sought philosophical approaches which were more women-friendly in their theoretical presuppositions and sought to identify specifically female forms of philosophy. 
One of the first of and very influential studies of this kind was Carolyn Merchant's The Death of Nature, published back in 1980. Others focused on, on what they saw as the inherent sexism of philosophy. Um, uh, people like Dale Spender and her provocatively entitled book, The Women of Ideas and What Men Have Done to Them. Not to mention Londa Shebinger's The Mind Has No Sex? Question mark. The exclusion of women from philosophy was thus explained metaphysically by the masculinist character of philosophy itself, and I should add, of science. Now, a drawback of much of this, this approach is, uh, well, there are many drawbacks, but, but the one I would particularly emphasise is that it is almost exclusively restricted to the negative aspects of women's history. Um, nevertheless, these, these pioneering endeavours were well received, and, um, and, um, but overall they produced variable results. Nevertheless, I would say it is remarkable that these early works achieved what they did in the absence of historical narratives which gave credible attention to women. And um, it has been the endeavour of a number of women, women historians of philosophy, to attempt to put that right, the work of women historians of philosophy um, like Eileen O'Neill, Jacqueline Broad, Karen Green and, and others. At the same time, there has been a, a alongside of this of course, has been a big effort to retrieve the women, retrieve women from obscurity by editing and publishing their writings, which have not been available. And at this, but at this point in time, most, though not all, of the philosophers recovered in this way were from early, the early modern period. Um, people like Elizabeth of Bohemia, Margaret Cavendish, and Conway, Mary Astell, and Catherine Trotter Coburn. These are the figures most easily available today. I would say a notable ex exception is Ruth's um, collection, which tries to bring in the philosophers from, from ever since antiquity um, uh, as well. So, um, things have come a long way in the last 30 years. We know the names of far more women philosophers than were recognised in the 1980s. Um, we now recognise that people like Marie de Gournay and Mary Astell and Mary Wollstonecraft deserve to be thought about as philosophers and not just as learned ladies or bolshe women, in the case of Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, and there is now a constructive debate about the place of women philosophers in the history of philosophy. There have been changes in the history of philosophy which make it more hospitable to um, non-canonical figures and to historical context. Um, and we are now increasingly likely to find women included in handbooks of the history of philosophy, and we're less likely to have to justify including them, including them. And I think it is not insignificant that the first meeting of the European Society for Early Modern Philosophy in 2007 included a panel on women philosophers. How far these developments impact on the wider philosophical public remains an open question. And we still face the challenge of how to write the history of philosophy so as to include women philosophers, and how to do this without consigning them to minor status. One thing that has been clear all along is that, as the saying goes, you can't just add women and stir as if they were some exotic ingredient that you put into your, your recipe. Um, well, what I, um, uh, what, what I want to, to, to focus on um, uh, today is, 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 is uh, um, one of the, I mean, one of the things I would, I would say is that one of the things, one of the barriers that we still have is the, the kind of approach we take to the history of philosophy, uh, that different approaches yield different results when it comes to thinking about how to include women 
and it's my contention that the approach least hospitable to their inclusion is the conception of the history of philosophy which is dominant in, the, in Anglo American philosophy today. This is perhaps paradoxical because, because most of the, uh, much of the work on women philosophers being done today is being undertaken by people grounded in this tradition. So, um, and I'm going to want to argue that we have to adopt an appropriate approach to the history of philosophy um, and that this needs to be a fully historicized approach. Um, just to underline this, I shall now first survey um, some of the issues connected with recovering women philosophers and, and make some points about what we do with the material that we recover. And in that connection, I shall say a few words uh, about the interconnected issues of canon formation um, and, 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 and the approach you take to history. Well, it's probably easier to write a history of women philosophers than a history of philosophy that includes women, for the simple reason that there is less ground to clear. It's already clear. We have a blank almost blank page. A separate history of women's philosophy also obviates the danger of subordinating their achievement to their more famous male contemporaries. Now, the work of, um, of, of, of the, the pioneers in this area, like uh, Mary Ellen Waite and Therese Bruce Dykeman, is has been very important for raising awareness of, that there were female philosophers in the past, um, and, um, and making us aware of their thought. But separate women histories of women philosophers are at best only partial history. Such histories risk being sidelined, being ghettoized as a curiosity um, of minor figures who happen to be women. On the other hand, inserting women into the mainstream alongside men risks diminishing their contribution. And it's, hard, um, and it's still hard to find a place for women philosophically without reference to a previously established canon of philosophers who happen to be male. Conway to Leibniz, for example. Elizabeth of Hereford to Descartes. Constance Jones to Bertrand Russell, and so on. Um, the reason for this is not, I would add, exclusive to women. The same, the same problem is faced when we try to bring some of the so-called minor men back into the picture. Um, and that would include the Cambridge Platonists, uh, on whom I have worked. Um, well, another thing which makes it difficult to place women's contribution in, in a general history of philosophy is the basic problem of sources. Um, they're right, they're, the, the sources are often discontinuous and fragmentary, and this makes it very difficult to construct a historical narrative. Um, one problem is that they are often uh, only known by, uh, indirectly through the people with whom they came into con contact. Um, of, some didn't commit anything to paper, their writings have been lost, or they philosophized orally. We know that Elizabeth von der Faltz, or Elizabeth of Hereford, as I think we, we, we agree we ought to, to be calling her, we know that she was a philosopher because she corresponded with Descartes. But there are no other extant writings um, to, to support, um, or to, to tell us much about what she had to, 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 to think about. We also know, know that her, her niece, Sophia Charlotta, discussed philosophy with Leibniz, but we only have indirect knowledge of her philosophical views. Now, of course, this is a historiographical problem. It's the kind of problem that occurs elsewhere in the history of philosophy. Uh, scholars of ancient philosophy, for example, have long been accustomed to the fragmentary state of the evidence for pre-Socratic philosophers. And the fact that Socrates wrote nothing down has not hindered them from acquiring information about his philosophy. So it's a problem, but it's not an insurmountable problem. Periodization is another problematic area. The list of women philosophers produced by recent works on women's philosophy of the past has identified women thinkers in periods 
which fall outside the traditional story of modern philosophy, particularly in um, no, particularly medieval and Renaissance women. It's perhaps not accidental that most of the work done to date has been on women who fit the existing periodizations. Conway, the critic of Descartes, or, or um, um, who anticipated Leibniz, for example. Catherine Trotter of Coburn, who defended Locke's philosophy. However, the, even they don't fit really very well within these traject trajectories. Conway's Platonism and her closeness to the Cambridge Platonists um, his intention with the received narrative of the rise of modern philosophy, as is M Madame du Châtelet's reconciliation of Leibniz and Newton, in his intention with the received story, at least in Britain, of the history of science. We also have to recognise that the themes and interests of philosophic and philosophical priorities of the past were in most cases very different from today, and I'll have more to say about this in, in shortly. But this, to, this, in its turn, links to the question of genre, the genre in which philosophy is written. Um, as work on women thinkers increases, we shall be able to form a better sense of the questions which interested them and of whether there are any topics and questions which are specific to women. My own experience of researching philosophical women of the past shows that an enlarged sense of philosophical genre is vital for gauging their philosophical activity. For example, letters. Um, as I've indicated, letters are sometimes the only source we have for their, the fact that they, were, they had philosophical uh, interests at all. Um, and in some cases, as in the case of Elizabeth of Hereford, it's the only, only source. Um, so the history of philosophy should, ref uh, should uh, reflect how women philosophize in practice, whether through correspondence, through commentary, through poetry, through novels. It is very important to, to have a very open view of what constitutes philosophical genre. Well, at the heart of the problem of getting the history of philosophy to bring women into focus is the modern canon, which is designed to tell a story of philosophy which is oriented towards present-day philosophical interests, and it thus and it, 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 it inevitably perpetuates a divide between those philosophers considered to be major and those considered to be minor. The received canon is founded on conception of philosophy, philosophers, and philosophical significance, which are are too restrictive to accommodate women. The canon enshrines a consensus of thinkers reached without women in mind, um, and the narrative which, which it, uh, it, it illustrates ignores their contribution. As Karen Green and Jacqueline Broad have pointed out, piggybacking, that is, hitching a ride on, the, on developments of men's ideas, distorts women's contribution principally by excluding them. However, it is also the case that um, some feminist philosophers, uh, particularly those of analytic bent, have not been immune to accepting uncritically the historical pictures set by the received canon. The prevailing canon is endorsed by and perpetuated by a view of philosophically, philosophical history wholly presentist in orientation, hostile to canonical, non-canonical thinkers and um, limited in the chronological domain of philosophy which it covers. So it is just common sense that to include women requires changing, um, requires changing the canon, but it requires more than that. It requires changing the grounds on which the canon is selected, changing the basis on which the received story of philosophy is constructed, changing how we go about the history of philosophy. The view that the history of philosophy should concern itself with what philosophers today find relevant and interesting in the philosophy of the past is a prevailing assumption in the Anglo-American philosophical tradition of the post-analytic period. On this view, other aspects of the philosophical past are, are, are generally called the history of ideas, with all that that, that, that implies in, in terms of, of, of um, 
with that not really being true philosophy. The result is that Anglo-American history of philosophy focuses on canonical figures who are now regarded as major and on those aspects of their thought believed to have relevance today. Um, well, I should guess that in fairness to them, that is a general feature of, of canonical kind of formation. But this particular view is one which excludes from purview um, non-canonical figures, themes which are no longer thought of as interesting, and it, it, it doesn't take any interest in the context, be it philosophical or social, in which philosophers philosophize, or what they in their time considered relevant and important. It also excludes huge swathes of history not deemed to have contributed anything of significance to philosophy, notably the Middle Ages and Renaissance. The fate of minor figures, of non-canonical figures, has been to be relegated to the history of ideas or to oblivion. And they're only likely to be rescued from there if they are perceived to be relevant to one of the great philosophers, or if they have been fa be, are found to have said something considered by philosophy na philosophers now as interesting and important. Among the minor figures of philosophy, women philosophers have fared particularly badly. They simply have not figured. And this is true of women who both did contribute to philosophical developments and those who did not. And women whose contribution has been lost because there's no written evidence for it, or because they published anonymously or didn't publish at all. Well, to be fair, within the Anglo-American traditions, there are honourable exceptions to the rule that historians of philosophy should be attentive solely to present interests and canonical figures. And, and I would cite the, uh, the Garber, Ayers, um, uh, Cambridge History of 17th Century Philosophy as an example, and Stephen Nadler's Companion to Early Modern Philosophy, both of which have tried to include some of, of, of non-canonical non, uh, figures. Um, by contrast with the tradition I've been describing, it's my experience that Europe, in uh, European traditions, um, historians of philosophy are more comfortable about regarding historical aspects as integral to the history of philosophy, and, um, and, and the Europe, Euro European traditions are less likely to focus on present-day present problems as the main driver of investigation. European traditions are uh, apparent in the work of the two most important American historians of philosophy of the second half of the 20th century, Richard Popkin and Charles Schmidt, both of whom were influenced by the great German refugee historian of Renaissance philosophy, Paul Oscar Christella. And in point of fact, um, I believe the most successful work of the recovery of women has been undertaken by using the techniques and methodological assumptions that are regarded by the analytics as mere history of ideas rather than history of philosophy. <clears throat> so, um, the, his, this, the, the separation, the separation but, but the separation of the so-called history of ideas from the history of philosophy, in my view, entails a repudiation of the very means by which recovering women philosophers has been possible. Now, a classic statement of this separation, although he didn't have women in mind when he made it, is Bernard Williams' posthumously published essay, Descartes and the Historiography of Philosophy, Originally, um, originally um, it's based on the papers he gave in the 70s and 80s. The history of ideas, writes Williams, looks sideways to the context of the philosopher's ideas in order to realise what their the author might be doing in that situation, while the history of philosophy is likely to look at his influence on the course of philosophy from his time to the present. He asserts, uh, more, furthermore, that fundamentally these are incompatible approaches because, quote, the best possible history of, of ideas is likely to show that philosophy did not in fact mean, in contemporary terms, what subsequent philosophy has most made of it. Um, 
Well, although I disagree with Williams about uh, what he uh, says about the history of ideas, I think there is nevertheless a key lesson we can learn from him and from, from, from his, um, uh, his, his observations. And he, made, he makes these comments, um, he made this argument in relation to the habit of treating past philosophers as if they were talking to us today. Um, he warns against, uh, he questions the assumption that contemporary philosophical debates originate directly in past philosophy, and he questions whether we should read um, the philosophy of the past as if it were contemporary. His point rests on the important observation that philosophy of the past was understood differently from today, um, differently in its own time. Um, this is a fundamental historical point, and I'll just quote from Williams, although it cost me a bit run over time a bit. The idea of treating philosophical writings of the past as if they were contemporary, he writes, is at the limit simply unintelligible. If one abstracts entirely from their history, uh, one, uh, uh, one has an obvious problem of what, um, what project is even supposed, what one is even supposed to be considering. One seems to be left simply with a set of words in some modern language, which in many cases has been generated by a translator, and one associates the, with these words with whatever possible philosophical notions they may carry today. This activity has no title to being history of any sort. Well, I couldn't agree more than that. Um, what Williams goes on to do is to advocate using um, past philosophy then as a way of critiquing the present. Uh, now, I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to, 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 um, to talk about that, but um, uh, what he, he does seem to be advocating is a kind of almost Brechtian use of past philosophy to challenge assumptions about the present, a kind of Verfremdungs effect. Um, and I think uh, that, that perhaps we can, we can bring this into play um, when we turn to look at, uh, at the, uh, the, the, the in, 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 in agreeing with him, that there is some usefulness in actually disconnecting past and present. That what he suggests um, about the difference between past and present has important strategic value for, for recovering the women of the past. Because to, dis, to, to insist on disconnecting past philosophy and present philosophy uh, holds a key to eliminating the major minor distinction that is used today as an organising principle of the history of philosophy. If we disconnect canonical figures from their present use, um, we have the means of opening up the domain of, of, of the history of philosophy to non-canonical figures to the forgotten themes of past philosophy. And crucially, we, um, we, we have the means to call in question modern, unhistorical assumptions about influence and canon formation, which support and perpetuate um, the mi major minor distinction which distorts the history of philosophy. To treat philosophy of the past on its own terms, to give all philosophers of the past a hearing, so to speak, irrespective of their presumed status, levels the playing field for women because it will benefit everyone, men as well as women, who are routinely consigned to minor status. The way will be open for the construction of new histories, unencumbered by assumptions about major and, or minor, and such an approach challenges the very basis on which that status has been accorded. It doesn't necessarily demote uh, great, the great philosophers. It opens the way for a better understanding of what makes them important. It puts us in a better position to see how philosophy developed across time and, um, and um, uh, to trace the, 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 the fortunes of philosophy in history. None of this could be achieved without historical investigation nor could it be achieved without philosophical understanding. 
it doesn't dispose of the problem that historically women were in the minority in, in the philosophical community, um, but it does permit us to ed ed educate whether this was really so, and if so, why. Well, it's certainly the case that modern interests are driving the recovery of women philosophers, and without the resurgence of interest in women of the past, mon um, modern feminism and the women's movement, women philosophers would remain concealed in the, the dust of history. The pr pressure to find a genealogy of women philosophers is unrelenting, and a canon of women philosophers is fast emerging. The most the work done on women's philosophy of the past is not free from attempts to read modern ideas back into the early thinkers, and so I think it is important, therefore, to keep in mind Williams's caveats about unhistorical reading. The history of women philosophers must not make the mistake of abstracting the philosophical writings of women from the past from its history and treating them as if they were contemporary. If we heed Williams's advice about not abstracting them from their history, we shall be able the better to avoid the historical errors of the modern canon of treating the past as if it were present to us. Well, there's no easy answer to the challenges and problems to be faced when writing the history of philosophy. Um, my discussion of the issues is far from exhausted. Um, I will just bring this to a close, and, and we can perhaps talk about this in, in, in discussion. But I would just to bring this to, 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 to conclude by saying that there is a very practical sense in which women's philosophy needs the history of philosophy. The recovery of women's contribution <coughs> philosophy of, to philosophy requires us to face problems created by the boundaries of the discipline and historical trajectories which do not necessarily accommodate female thinkers. We have to review and rethink our conception of philosophy, of who qualifies to be considered a philosopher, the criteria by which we judge some more significant than others, and in order to do that, we have to dispense with a narrow model of the history of philosophy um, uh, in, in favour of one which is historically based. This applies, I would say, as much to um, male philosophers as to women. But at the root of all is the need to recover the writings of women philosophers to make them accessible in modern editions which illuminate their history by respecting their history, historicity and to give us uh, the materials um, with which to, to build our, our history. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I would say they do have advantages, and I, I did, did, did and, and I hope I didn't convey the impression that, that I didn't think they did. In fact, I think I think um, I, I mentioned the work of Mary Ellen Waite. I mentioned the work of 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 of, of uh, 
some feminists who are, with whom I don't share um, that, that views, but I think that they've done immensely important work in saying these people were there, they are there, you can't ignore them. Um, and so to focus on the history of women's philosophers does have the huge, the huge benefit that it, um, uh, it, uh, it, it, as it, it, makes, it makes us aware of them, where they would be probably hidden below the radar in, in, a, in, a, in a wider um, philosophical context. Um, the other enormously important thing about doing the history of women's philosophy um, separately is that it enables us to focus really on what they were thinking about and to try and understand what they were thinking about um, before we then try and then think about the problems of well where, where do we put them in the history of you know, the, the wider history of philosophy. So although I said it gives us a partial history it's still a history worth and very important to do and we can't get the other a fuller history without doing it so I think it is, it is very important yes. how to bring women philosophers into focus. And um, a strategy might be to revise the history of women philosophers without reference to man's name. So uh, do you think um, or do you think it is possible? One one might protest and say, oh what a discrimination of man. But but a really uh, interesting question for me is um, Well, it, is, it does tend to be the case that particular philosophical questions and issues tend to be associated with a male name. Um, the mind-body problem, Descartes comes to mind straight away. In fact, Descartes didn't talk about mind and body, he talked about soul and body, but you see that's a historian's perspective. Um, well, yes, I mean, I think, I think it, 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 it is... Theoretically, yeah, I think it is feasible to, to actually think, well, here are the, um, these are the, the, if you think about what, what, what are the questions and problems and so on that constitute philosophy, we could talk about those without, without mentioning, when you say name, I take it you mean the, the name of the philosopher. Famous name, yeah. and Yes, I think, you know, you can talk about skepticism without talking about particular skeptics. And you can talk about, um, um, I mean, it's difficult perhaps to talk about pre-established harmony without thinking about Leibniz, but, 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 but actually, you, you, the, in order to explain it, you've got to go to, to things more fundamental than his name. So, so yes, I think, I think that, that if we, um, um, I, I think it, it is possible and, 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 and it would be interesting and practical to do, to, to do things that way. The, I think the, the limitation, but at the same time I think we must be open to the possibility that, that the inherited body of questions and problems are not necessarily, this, first of all, they're not the same for us as they were for, for people, for, for many of these people in the past, and, and we're talking about past women after all, and, and secondly, there may have been other issues which haven't fully come into philosophy. Um, which they they were interested in. So we must be open to the possibility that there may be other questions and other problems, um, and that um, uh, and and very much also open to open to the to the to what well, is actually established fact that their 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 um, their own thinking about particular problems often come up with solutions which which don't. Um, don't fit with the received received views. So I don't think you know I'm you know I'm I'm very wary about ghettoizing women, but I think strategically there are um, and pedagogically there are good reasons for for taking particular approaches. But we mustn't never lose sight of the the wider picture where where, where this all belongs.
Zeitraum von wann? Was? To my mind, uh, a very pragmatic question um, um, is in, in the foreground. How do you convince people who believe in this dichotomy between philosophy and history of ideas that philosophy might have been something different? I don't know the answer to this question. <laughs> I, I wish I did. But I... Um, uh, I'm very encouraged by something Richard Popkin wrote in his Columbia History of Philosophy, which is not terribly well edited book, but never mind. He says, as interests change, the canon will change. And actually, the canon as, um, and the, 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 the things people were interested, philosophers were interested in in the, in the, in the 1950s, are not the same as the things philosophers are interested in now. So the canon does get rewritten. As soon as you can show that there is canon, the canons re have to be rewritten, you're surely showing that, um, that, 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 that uh, the canon is actually part of history. Uh, so that maybe there is a way in, in that way. But um, philosophers do like to think that they deal with eternal questions and eternal problems and it's quite disconcerting to discover what you, you think of as an eternal question. Um, it doesn't have that same mathematical eternity as, 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 you, as, as you thought. The analogy with number doesn't, doesn't actually fit. Mm. So it's done, Professor. <laughs>